Good morning. Welcome to Bridgehampton Presbyterian Church, where we continue our summer sermon series, Patriarchal Ponderings. And this week, our topic is Jacob's Wives. Join me in a prayer. Eternal God, help us to now fix our attention on what you wish to offer to us through the words of Scripture. Enable us to hear in such a way as we're also constrained to respond. Amen. And our scripture reading today is from the book of Genesis, chapter 29, and reading verses 15 through 28. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful and lovely. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man, so stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him just a few days because of the love he had for her. And then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah, to his daughter Leah to be her maid. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What's this that you've done to me? Didn't I serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we'll give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. And so, Jacob did. She completed her week, and then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, to wife. Strange story. Jacob's wives. In our patriarchal ponderings, we saw last week, Jacob had a dream of a ladder going up to heaven. But that wasn't the only dream that Jacob had. He also had another dream, a dream a lot of people have. The kind that has consumed generations before and ever since. He's in love. His dream girl is called Rachel. Leah, Rachel's sister, ah, she was okay, she had nice eyes. But when Jacob thought about Rachel, oh, mama, that lady was fine. And he promises himself, she will be mine. In our lives, we have dreams, we have passions, we have dreams for our relationships, for our families, maybe for our community or even our church. The lesson we learn from Jacob is that seeing our dreams come to something can take a while and we may not always get exactly what we expected along the way. This passage shows us a number of things. Firstly, this passage reveals that we're broken vessels that have to live with the consequences of their own shortcomings. And secondly, that we're surrounded by those who do not share our values and are as equally broken as we are. But thirdly, this passage has something overwhelmingly positive to tell us. That whenever love 
is real. It can change things. And God has an unusual way of turning our dreams into his plans. But firstly, <clears throat> this passage reveals our broken lives. Our broken lives. Let's remind ourselves of who Jacob was. This is the mummy's boy who deceived his visually handicapped father to get an inheritance that should have been that of his twin brother. This is the Jacob who was doing all he could do to avoid a confrontation with Esau because Esau had vowed, if I ever see Jacob again, I'm going to kill him. This is the Jacob who had become aware God was on his case after having a strange dream of a stairway to heaven. Far from comforting him, this dream terrifies him and caused him to rethink his relationship to God and gave him a sense that life might turn out better if he started trying to do things God's way instead of listening mostly to his mother's advice. Now Jacob is no wide-eyed innocent enduring his first teenage crush. Life was actually passing him by at speed and it seems relationships weren't something he had a lot of time for. But then he sets eyes on Rachel and something goes zing! Who can explain that? The mystery of human attraction. That crazy little thing called love. And it doesn't seem to matter if one's a sinner or a saint. Once Cupid fires his little golden arrow, people are rendered helpless. And it looks like things are going to work out. Rachel's dad, Laban, seems to like Jacob. Because of family connections, he offers him a job. And when the subject of payment comes up, Jacob says, All I want is your daughter Rachel's hand in marriage. Laban smiles, and it seems like it's a done deal. But seven years later, it turns sour, really sour. Jacob is getting ready for his wedding night. No doubt there was a lot of partying going on, probably a bit of drinking involved. But the upshot of it all is that when Jacob awakes in the morning, it's not Rachel lying at his side, but her sister, Leah. Not the lady he thought was so fine he lost sleep thinking about her, but her sister. Ouch. Laban, the girl's father, has turned out to be a snake. He turns out to be as cruel and devious and sly and calculated and shifty and unreliable and untrustworthy and manipulative as, well, he turned out to be as much of a sneak as Jacob himself. <laughs> they do say what goes around comes around, and Jacob encounters in Laban someone who was out Jacob. Jacob. We sometimes think in life we can escape our own shortcomings and that we can gloss over our faults. The scary thing is they can sometimes confront us in the bad behaviour of others who share our faults to such an extent that we finally see what fools we can be. How many times have we said, there but for the grace of God go I? And how often do we find that we recoil at other people's actions because actually we have a horrible fear, the kind of fear we bury whenever it raises its ugly head, the fear that we could be that way ourselves. We never truly escape our upbringing or the mistakes of the past. They, they come back, they haunt us in the most unlikely of ways. Ever been to a school reunion and you're recalling the good times, but also memories of bad times are referenced. I can't believe we used to call him that. 
Uh, oh, what were we thinking? Friends, we're all broken. Paul in the book of Romans simply says, there's no difference. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Life can, as it did with Jacob, bring along experiences that reveal our brokenness. And that's not always a bad thing, because oftentimes it's only when we see where we're going wrong that we want to start putting things right. A second thing revealed in this passage is we're not the only broken ones. We're not the only broken ones. The actions of those who are broken around us can cause us great pain. Laban hurts not only Jacob but also Rachel and Leah. Because of the tension he creates between them all, he will also hurt their children. We, we don't get to hear the complete story of Jacob's interactions with Laban, but I can tell you, things do not improve further down the line. What we did get to hear in our story was Laban's lame excuse for marrying Jacob to his older daughter instead of his younger one. He tells Jacob that, well, that's just the custom around here. We don't allow the younger one to get the inheritance before we've taken care of the senior child's needs. <laughs> was this God's way of making Jacob understand just what a rotten thing he had done to his brother Esau. Esau, after all, was the oldest child who had deserved to be taken care of first, even if he was only older by an arm's length. One of the twins had to be born first, and that counted for something back in those days. Once again, some kind of negative karma seems to be impacting Jacob and enabling him to see the error of his ways. <clears throat> we have no control over what others do to us. If folk around us are mad or uncaring towards us or disrespectful of us, then while we don't have to be a doormat and let them walk all over us, we also have to accept that there's some folks we just can't change. Why? Because they, like us, are broken. That's not an excuse to put up with bad actions or reprehensible behavior, just to say that some people are very, very, very resistant to change. We don't have a choice in the way other people act towards us, but we can choose the way we respond to them. We can choose to go beyond gut reactions and, and the search for vengeance. We can come to the realisation that when we hold anger towards others, it's chewing us up far more than it is them. And our model for doing that is our Saviour, Jesus Christ. In him, we see a compassion that refuses to be sidelined by those who reject it. As we take our hurts and our failures to God in prayer, so we seek for the strength to overcome our very human reactions, that they may become something more, something that carry the acceptance and love of God that we ourselves have found in Jesus Christ. In the midst of this crazy story about Jacob, we see a little miracle. Love changes Jacob. Love changes Jacob. When Jacob realised he has been tricked by Laban, the natural Jacob reaction would have been for him to get totally lost in it all, to storm off back home 
go to mother who would create a fuss with the rest of the family. Uh, everyone would get involved and soon it would be like the set of a Jerry Springer show. Family Feuds Part 2. But what happens in the story? Jacob asks Laban, oh, what's going on? Laban lays it out for him and says, if you want Rachel, then you have to work another seven years. And the miracle here is Jacob's silence. There's no argument. Laban says, fulfill your duties and get back to work. And we read, and Jacob did so. And Laban, after seven years, gave him Rachel, his daughter, as his wife. And that really moves us quickly to one of the few positive points in the story. When love is for real, it can change everything. When love is for real, it can change everything. There is, of course, more going on here than the fact that Jacob is crazy in love with Rachel. That's a, a huge part of it. But the other side of it is Jacob is beginning to realise that the love God has for him requires him to change. Jacob already knew God was on his case. He'd understood that when he experienced that dream of a ladder going up to heaven and was aware God was seeking to make a covenant with him, to walk with him and lead him in his life. And when he met Rachel, he must have thought, oh yeah, this could work. But Jacob also had to come to a place where he could be confronted by his sins in such a powerful way that he would determine that this time around things were going to be different through the love of a woman and the love of God. Change became a happening. We, we, can, we can run from our sins, we can run from our failures for a long time. But there needs to come for all of us those moments when we simply realise we need help. And the only true hope of forgiveness and change is the love of God that we can discover in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Only his life-changing spirit can take what is broken and make something beautiful out of it. We're victims of our own actions and we're victims of the actions of others. Jesus went to the cross as a victim to totally identify with our situation. The story, that story didn't end in death, but in new life, in the birth of the church, in the blossoming of hope, in people who recognize their need and encounter God's love. We, like Jacob, we live our lives. We may well fall in love and we may face many strange twists and turns. We will sin and we shall be sinned against. So we can learn even from this passage about Jacob. We can learn, we're all broken. We can learn that through the love of God, broken lives can be remade. And we can learn to watch and wait and trust that in God's time, all things are possible. The crazy little thing called love really can make a difference. And whenever we allow God's love and peace and, and joy and hope to transform us, nothing ever remains the same. And to God's name be all glory.
Amen. Please join me in a prayer. Lord our God, as we hear these stories from distant times, we encounter a different world. We read of family rivalries and betrayals and trade-offs. We read of love seeking to hold all things together. Maybe the times are not so different after all. We too are concerned to raise our families and create communities where we can live alongside each other respectfully and peacefully. We also need to hear your rich promises and know that you walk with us through the changing days of our lives. As church communities, we need to be reassured of your presence, for we remain concerned as to where our faith journey may lead us in challenging times. Through your Holy Spirit, grant us a passion for the gospel that causes us to attempt great things for your love. Like Jacob, who wouldn't let go of his love for Rachel, may we seek to see your ways established in our midst, even though such may take time. Grant to us the gift of patience and the wisdom to see that our plans aren't always your plans and your ways are not necessarily our ways. When we're headed in the right direction, continue to move us forward. When we're off course, bring us back to the true path. We lift up in prayer all those who are facing difficult days. Those who are discouraged, those who feel like they'll never make it. Those who have no idea where they're going. We pray for all who are passing through the ordeal of physical pain or mental anxiety, for victims of accident and crime and terrorism. We offer any particular concerns we hold in our hearts. And we pray for the nation, divided and uncertain, that in our choices we may seek to put the good of all beyond any selfish advantages. We lift up nations of great need in our world, those stalked by hunger, disease and oppression, those where war continues to rage. May your church in every land bear witness to the higher way embodied in the teachings of Jesus and the power of his Holy Spirit to bring transformation. For all our prayers we would bring together as we pray words Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. Well, thank you again for tuning in to our weekly ponderings. A strange passage this morning, coming from a world long gone, and yet so many similarities. We all need the love that only God can give us. And let us try and take what we have received of that love into our lives and to the lives of all we will meet this week. And so now, go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And let the people say, Amen.